Okay, welcome to our Hanukkah service. And um, I have a short little message I'd like to share with us because we're going to partake of communion together. And I want to point out a few things before communion. And then John and Diane will, will minister communion to us. The title of this short message is Brothers Together in Unity. Brothers Together in Unity, which is interesting because we just had a vision of the Lord brought to us about this very subject. Turn with me, if you like, to Psalms chapter 133, verses 1 through 3. And I'm reading from the NASB. It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Amen. Oh, amen. It is. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down over the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. That oil represents the anointing. It's like the anointing, the precious oil, the anointing oil, the, the oil of the Lord that is poured over the head for anointing. Coming down the beard, even Aaron's beard, which is the head of the priesthood, which is Christ. Is Christ anointed? Fully, from the head down. He's fully anointed. Coming down, it says, upon the edge of his robes, the very edge of his robes, where the woman with the issue of blood touched the edge of his robes. She was instantly healed. Praise God. That anointing is there. It goes on to say, it is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands the blessing. Life for all the ages. Life. Because if your life is hidden in Christ's life, who is anointed head to toe, then you are also alive and will one day also be just as anointed. And what is the oil that Christ is anointed with? The very presence of God, the Shekinah glory of the Lord. Praise God. John chapter 17. And I'm going to read from verse 23. I in them, Jesus says, and you, Lord, in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. The Lord is saying a, a, a wonderful thing here. He's saying, uh, I in them, so I'm going to come into them in my spirit, but you're fully in me, so you're coming into them in spirit because you're in me. That we may be perfected, and it's interesting, the word perfected literally means to be made mature. It's the mature man of Ephesians. To be raised up into the very image and likeness of Christ. A whole body unified is one, raised up in the image and likeness of Christ. And this so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. And so what it's saying is it's saying that the Lord will make it obvious in the world that Jesus is Lord and that he is also loves us as the Lord loves, us, loves Christ and that uh, he was sent into the world. Why does this matter? Because the Lord and his mercy is trying. He's trying right now in the wars that are happening. He's trying to reveal himself. He's trying to reveal himself so that those who are hungry for the Lord will have a vision of him and be able to give their hearts to him. He's trying in his mercy to reveal himself, both in warfare, but in the future through his church. He can't reveal himself through his church right now because his church is weak 
uh, compromised, asleep, and defeated. But one day, the Lord is going to manifest through his bride church, and it's going to be a glorious image of God himself through his people. Praise God. I'd like to move on here to the book of Ephesians. And uh, chapter 4. And I'm going to start with verse 3. It says, Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So Paul is saying, look, I, let me start over. Verse 1. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Verse 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What does it take to preserve the unity of the Spirit? What does it take? Well, the bond of peace. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, don't fight with one another. What does that mean? Verse 13, until... We all attain to the unity of the faith and have the accurate knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So it's not saying we have attained that ultimate unity yet, but we're moving in that direction. That's our goal. We're going in that direction to total perfect unity. Unity of the faith. Whose faith? Christ's faith. So that we're all looking at and we're all leaning on Christ's faith. If we do that, then we're all moving in the same direction because Christ is not divided. And of the accurate knowledge of the Son of God, aha, it requires something theologically, an accurate knowledge of the Son of God. So it can't be a foreign God, a multi-headed God, it can't be a, a, a God that's half man, half God, because that breaks scripture. It can't be a God that can be defeated. It can't be a God that can die, because that all breaks scripture. So an accurate knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. So the man-child bride company of saints. The man-child and the bride are the same. Same group of people. So when... When is our ultimate unity? When we all become the bride. When we all attain to that position. To the mature man. To the mat, uh, a measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Praise God. Don't you know that God said it? It's right there in his word. He said it. Therefore it is yea and amen. It is going to happen. Praise God. Again. What is the bond that, of unity? What is the bond that brings us together in that perfect unity? Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Beyond all these things, put on agape love. God's love. Which is the perfect bond of unity. So when do we come into the bride? When do we come into the man-child company of saints? When do we come into that place of ultimate maturity? When the agape love of God falls upon the church. When does that happen? When the anointing arrives. The anointing on Aaron's head and down his beard and upon the edge of his uh, robes. There's an anointing coming. There's an anointing that will drive us together that will make us as one, that will uh, unify us in a way that we've never known before. Until that day, we partake of communion, both in remembrance of what the Lord has done for us in his sacrifice, and remembrance that we are all of the same spirit. John and Diane, if you would prepare the emblems. We're all of the same spirit. The wine represents the spirit, the life of Christ that we shed for us. And the spirit of Christ mixed with the spirit of God that was given to us. See, here's an interesting thing. If you look at the wine, 
the grape juice. It's purple. Purple is the royal color. The reason it is, is because God's color is royal blue. Royal blue, kind of like this shirt. Even a hair deeper blue than this. But man's color is red. Life is in the blood. Adam is Adam because the word in Hebrew means blood in the face or red in the face, blushing. Mix the two together and you have purple. And that's why the wine represents the blood of Christ. It is God mixed with man, the second Adam. The Shekinah glory returned, the light of God returned to us. And the emblem of it Excuse me, those of you on YouTube. The emblem of it being the wine. The purple color representing both the, the presence of the Spirit of God in man, in the second man. Bev, would you come up? I'll get you one. I need one more, John. I have it there. Praise God. Those of you on YouTube, this is my lovely wife, Beverly. <laughs> I'd like to go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 for a moment. And verses 16 and 17, I'd like to read that. Paul speaking to the Corinthian church and to us. And he's saying, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we are uh, to break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So what he's saying is this. He's saying, look, he's saying, look, we're one, we're one body. And just as this bread comes from one loaf, which is Christ, and broken for us, and then passed out to us. So as we partake of it, it now represents each other. Just as this wine represents the blood of Christ shed for us, but it also represents the spirit of God in Christ inside each one of us. Isn't that amazing? We are unified by this one spirit that is in all of us and his faith, which also is in all of us. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of the Lord and of each other. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Praise the Lord. So as we partake of the emblems, we are partaking of each other. We're remembering everything the Lord did for us. It's a reminder, though, that his spirit is in each one of us, unifying us together as brothers before the Lord. 
in the same spirit, born again to the same faith, and that is Christ's faith. I'd like to, uh, we're a little bit early, so I'd like to go ahead and let John and Diane uh, collect the emblems and And now I'd like to uh, ask the Lord's blessing again. Lord Jesus, we thank you, O oh God, for this communion. And we thank you for uh, the sharing of uh, the body of Christ, Lord, and, uh, but especially for the sharing of the same spirit that unifies us as a body. And the faith of Christ, which caused us to be born again. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the unity. We thank you for your spirit poured out for us and poured into us, Lord. We thank you. Bless us now, O Lord, and let this unity grow and become stronger and stronger. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to move uh, into the next portion of our service, which is uh, Hanukkah, as soon as John and Diane are back. And so, does anyone have any comments or questions? No? All right. Well, um, I know that we all have, uh, uh, we've take, partaken of uh, communion many times, and we've made sure that our spirits are right before the Lord and before each other. And uh, I really feel like uh, those of us that are, here and are the remnant that was prophesied of many years ago um, that uh, uh, we are unified and that our hearts are right with each other. And uh, that's wonderful. And this is probably the first time that it's been this unified. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Diane does a uh, beautiful job of this uh, oil lamp. This is an uh, oil lamp uh, bought in Israel. Uh, Brother Paul bought it uh, for us. There's uh, several replicas along the walls there. They're not fired, so you, we don't put oil in them. Uh, this one is fired, so we can put oil in it, but this was um, made, this was the actual size and made uh, from um, the uh, museum pieces that they've recovered from archaeological digs. And so each one of these different types of oil lamps you see along the windows are different types that they've recovered from different uh, time periods. Isn't that interesting? And this is one. And this was, you know, you think, well, those lamps are huge. No. This is about flashlight size. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's, uh, it is our symbol of the Shekinah in the temple of the Lord in heaven. Now, what happened? So we went through the teaching of Hanukkah, and we talked about that. And uh, went into a little bit of detail, just a, a quick overview. We know that Hanukkah is normally a, quote, Jewish holiday. But what um, Messianic Jews have uh, discovered is that, uh, no, it always pointed to Jesus. So whoever is born again, it's their holiday. Yes, it's Israel's national holiday because it represented their victory over the world the armies of the world which came against Israel, and through a miracle, a small ragtag uh, 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 army beat the most uh, professional army in the world at that time. As a matter of fact, it was such a shame 
that the Greek army lost, Antiochus Epiphanes, when he went home, his own people killed him because of losing a six-year war against the Jews, the smallest nation that they confronted. Isn't that amazing? The same thing's happening today. Israel's under attack today. And God is fighting for them. And people have, the nations around them have had a taste of God fighting for them. And so they're not very quick to go in and join uh, Hamas and try to destroy Israel. Because they know what it looks like to see giant angels on a hillside standing behind some old hand-me-down World War II tanks, uh, the few that were left, and, uh, and saving Israel. When they saw that, they dropped their guns and their tanks, uh, modern uh, T-54 and, and T-72 tanks, and ran, giving all, all up to Israel. So God is showing himself in these last days. God is revealing himself over and over again, though he makes Israel fight, and they lose people, and that's warfare. So there's a cost to pay for warfare, and sometimes the Lord judges and, uh, and rebukes uh, through the nations, and that's happening also. Yet, the Lord, this is all prophesied, and in the scripture, the Bible talks about Gaza in the last days. And talks about Gaza, the northern part of Gaza, never being inhabited by anyone except Jewish fishermen from this day onward. Isn't that amazing? This was prophesied. So stand with Israel. Stand with Israel. You'll be standing on the right side. Praise God. Israel, though, this is their national, uh, one of their national holy days. And so Hanukkah is very important to them. And, uh, but for Christians, it should be very important also because Hanukkah represents the bride of Christ in Christ. Yes, the miracle was that the menorah kept uh, burning for seven or eight days. And so they make a, a new uh, 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 menorah made out of eight lights with a separate one up higher than the other eight they call the shmash. Or the servant. It's a ninth. Nine is the number of judgment. The shamash represents Christ who is called the servant of all. The greatest servant of all history. Because in serving us, he died for all of mankind. He's the greatest servant of all history. And all of our judgment fell on him. He is that number nine. He is that ninth candle. Now the Orthodox Jews who created this and the Hashmonians who, uh, who dedicated the first uh, Hanukkah uh, menorah, uh, uh, they did it without, without knowing why they were doing this. Christ hadn't come. Yet they built this the way it is because it was by the Spirit of God. God did it because it was prophetic of what was about to happen. And what happened? The servant came. 165 years later, the servant came. He was born. Isn't that amazing? He was born 165 years later. All, the, the, all of this works together by God. You know, you, you look at the influence of the Greeks and you think, ah, it's terrible. It's so worldly, it's ungodly, it's, it's perverted. Yes, all of that is true. So why did the Lord allow it to happen? Why did the Lord allow the Greeks to take over the whole Middle East? Starting with Alexander the Great and then through the Seleucid kings years later. Why did he allow that? So that the whole Mediterranean would become Hellenized. That's why. Why? Why was that important? Because it gave them one language. For the first time, they all spoke one language. It's like today, uh, anywhere you go in the world, you'll find somebody that speaks English. And so because everybody could speak one language, guess what? Trade routes opened up. And they all of a sudden started trading with each other because they could communicate now more than ever before. They were trading before, but not like this. And then the Romans, do you know why the Romans took over the Middle East? 
because bandits were attacking the trade routes. And the Romans uh, petitioned kings, can we build a highway through your land for our trade? And so the king said, yeah, that'd be great. So Roman roads were invented, which some of those roads were so well constructed, they're still used today. Did you know a lot of highways in Europe and, or, or roads are built on top of Roman roads? Because they're still so good, they create the perfect base for, for just asphalting on top of. Isn't that amazing? So the Roman roads were invented. Why? So that the trade could happen easier, but everybody still spoke Greek, the common language, the English of its day. Everybody could communicate. Isn't that interesting? Well, why, why did the Lord allow the Romans to come and conquer everybody and all of that? To secure the highways. Why is all of that important? So the gospel could go out. It was all in preparation for the gospel. When in the Old Testament it says, make, make low the high places and bring up the low places. Make a highway unto our God. That was a prophecy of the Roman roads that were to come. Isn't that amazing? So the gospel could spread throughout the whole world, and that is the very highways that Paul and the apostles walked to spread the gospel around the whole world. Isn't that incredible? Everything works together for good for those who love God. Everything. You might say, oh, it's horrible being under the Romans. There's a purpose in it. It's horrible being under the Greeks. There's a purpose in it. There's a purpose, God's purpose. Sometimes you've got to get back a couple of hundred years to look at it, to see it. But once you get back, you go, oh, I get it. It had to happen. It had to happen. The amazing thing is when the, when the miracle happened on Hanukkah, that, that was a prophecy. And it pointed to 165 years down the road. 165 years it'll be fulfilled. At least the first part, the servant will arrive. You see, none of the menorah can be lit without the servant. The servant will arrive. Brother, would you come up, Thomas? Would you take the candle down below one of them? And here's what happened. When Mary conceived the Shekinah glory went from the temple of the Lord. Into Christ. Thank you, Thomas. And so the night that Christ was conceived... The Shekinah came from the temple back into the earth. Paul, I think we lost Monique. Um, and uh, and it, um, it returned the earth. Sorry, we're, we have a little issue with our Zoom. It returned to the earth. And then Jesus walked the earth for his 33 years of life while walking in the flesh until his crucifixion. And then he ascended, when he ascended on high, leading captivity captive unto God, emptying out hell and taking it to heaven. He came back 10 days later, just as scripture said that he would, bearing gifts and giving gifts to everyone. The first gift was the pouring out of his spirit at Pentecost. And when his spirit was poured out, then the Shekinah began coming into all the apostles and then pretty soon into the 3,000 that heard Peter's first sermon. The same day. So I'd like to invite Gary and Cammie if they would come up.
And there you go. Okay, so what happened is the Shekinah on the day of Pentecost moved from the servant to the saints. So if you would, go ahead and light all eight. Yeah, so take the fire from the servant. Praise God. So we have eight. We talked about this in our Hanukkah teaching. Because the four is the number of the bride of Christ. Ezekiel chapter 1 and and chapter 10. Four is the number of the bride of Christ. So why do we have four and four? Well, there are those who have died in Christ as bride saints. And those who are alive and remain. And we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, thank you, thank you, Gary, thank you, Cammie. We're told in 1 Corinthians 15 that at the sound of the last trump, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will rise with them. And then we will all be changed together in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And we will be in before the Lord of glory in heaven and waved as the next first fruits offering. Praise God. And as it's declared kosher, then the Lord will send us back Jacob's ladder to minister on the earth. Up and down. We've talked about about that before, especially in our uh, uh, Hanukkah teaching the other night, which you can listen to on YouTube. Now, at this time, I would like to uh, invite um, Sister Pat, if you would please uh, look up Psalms chapter 112, verse 4. Sister Monique, are you there? No? Okay. All right. Julie? Yes. Do you have your Bible? I do. Um, can you read that? Okay. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. That's your verse. Who w- would like to read one verse? Who else would like to? Thomas. Okay, Thomas, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. And then I'm going to take the last one. And I'm going to read Revelation 21 from our antique Bible, verse 22. Through 25. So, uh, first one, Psalms 112, verse 4. Nice and loud. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Watch how they build. Okay, next one, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. All right, and then we have Ephesians 5, 8. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. Amen. Walk as children of light. Praise God. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 22 through 25. I'm going to read it here. It says, Well, I'm going to read it in the NSB. It says, I saw no temple in it that is in the heavenly Jerusalem. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. 
And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illuminated it. And its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. I'm going to read on one more. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Praise God. Praise God. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful time. We thank you, Jesus, for your spirit, O oh God, that has... And your faith, O oh Lord, that has brought the Shekinah into our hearts. You caused us to become born again. When your spirit fell on us and we cried out that we are uh, sinners, need of a savior, your spirit came in, still filled with the presence of the Lord of glory himself. That, that presence left a mark on us. And that is our down payment, our deposit of the Shekinah glory of God, the light of life itself, that light that was seen in our creation on the first day, that was the first light. It didn't remain. It didn't stay there. When the sun and the moon and the stars were created, that light began to diminish so that the lesser light could be seen for a time, the lesser light that would be our teacher, the teaching light, the lesser light that would only hint of the real. They had actually brought the creation into being. The real that inside of all of us we long for. We long for the real. And Lord, in our hearts now, O oh God, as those who have a down payment, a portion of that glory, we long for the fullness of it. We long for the fullness of it that will redeem our bodies, O oh Lord, as well as our spirits. And will cause us to be with you and walk with you in the cool of the day, no matter where we are. That we will be with you. We will walk with you in the light of life. In that light that first came into the creation. And Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you because you have said this is where we're going. You have said this is where your ship will take us. And therefore, it is yea and amen. Forgive us for being impatient and bless us, O Lord, while we wait. We ask in Jesus' name. But Lord, we love you for it. We love you for it. Lord, bless us, O Lord, in fellowship. Bless us in our conversations. Bless, O Lord, those that aren't able to be with us today, but are with us in spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said. Amen. 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 Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs>